Good evening. I'm Harold Holzer speaking to you from Hunter College's Roosevelt House, which I'm proud to serve as director. And on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, it's a pleasure to welcome back our colleagues from the Living New Deal um, for another of our programs. And tonight, a discussion of food policy and food systems, both 90 years ago, in the midst of a national crisis of hunger and, to, and also today, when food disparity remains an, an unresolved challenge amidst so much great uh, wealth and, and plenty, the conundrum of our times, I guess. I'm reminded as we begin that nine decades ago, at around this very time of year, when FDR was in residence at this landmark as president-elect, strategizing with his brain trust to find solutions for the Great Depression. And as he worked for, from his transition headquarters, his modest library on the second floor of this very building, he could often hear disquieting voices of demonstrators right outside his window, chanting over and over again in the February cold, the heartbreaking lament, we want food, we want food. And as we know, he managed to respond. Tonight, our panel is scheduled to recall those historic responses and apply them to strategies needed to meet the challenges of today. Before I hand over to Jeff Gold, chair of the Metro New York Healthcare for All campaign and director of the Institute for Rational Mobility, I wanna thank those who have made this gathering possible. Our panelists, Kate McKenzie, director of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, Jan Poppendike, Professor Emerita of Sociology here at Hunter and co-founder of its New York City Food Policy Center. Um, our own acting director of the Food Policy Center who uh, Jeff will introduce in a moment and Myron Thurston, food supply chain expert um, in the Cornell system who I hear is the only panelist tonight who can claim that he milked some 350 cows uh, on his family's dairy farm, which is precisely 350 more cows than I have milked. So I await his report eagerly. Um, special thanks uh, for her role in, in organizing all things New Deal at Roosevelt House go to our historian and curator, Deborah Gardner, for her many years of work, um, always either uh, deinstalling or hanging a new exhibition at Roosevelt House. So please watch these pages, pages for the news of the latest. Um, and thank you, thank you, Deborah. And now with that, it's a pleasure to hand over the proceedings to the Living New Deal and our moderator, Jeff Gold. Thanks, Harold. And on behalf of uh... The Living New Deal, Roosevelt House and the Food Policy Center, welcome. Tonight, we'll hear our expert panel discuss the crisis facing our nation's food system and strategies to make it more equitable and resilient. This is one of a series of forums on current public policy issues and the through line from President Franklin Roosevelt's bold response to the Great Depression to today's debates about government's proper role in society. This is the mission and message of the Living New Deal, a nonprofit group founded in 2005 to remind Americans that to this day, they benefit from investments decades ago made in human development, public works, and the arts. First slide, please. This is a legacy that can inspire today's policy leaders to make major investments in social programs, public works, and environmental quality that will benefit urban and rural areas and every state for generations to come. We turn to food policy tonight because the nation's food supply chain is in crisis from one end to the other. The disrupt disruption of the COVID pandemic revealed how vulner vulnerable that system has become and those weaknesses persist. Next slide, please. 
This is a shared risk. Everyone has to eat. Everyone needs affordable and healthy food. Society pays a heavy cost when people go hungry and food supply chains impose burdens on producers, food workers, and communities. Next slide, please. Today's problems echo the challenges FDR faced immediately upon taking office. Widespread hunger, farmers and livestock producers facing foreclosures, environmental obstacles, including the devastation of the Dust Bowl. Next slide, please. FDR championed a broad range of programs delivered by an alphabet soup of new agencies, some illustrated here. You'll learn more about those tonight. New Deal spending touched every step in the nation's food chain, from farms to vital public works, in rural areas, hunger relief, and modern public markets for our cities. Next slide. It's especially timely this year to recall the New Deal's dramatic input on America's food system. When Congress is due to authorize the Farm Bill, this sweeping law defines the nation's agricultural policy. It funds farm support programs. It also includes SNAP, the largest food assistance program for low-income Americans, much in the news this very week. This year's Farm Bill debate will take place where the, while the memory of the recent food system failures is fresh in our minds. Just as important, across the country, may, many local efforts are underway to improve conditions for small farmers, to decentralize food processing, to improve the skills and protections for food workers. We know there's a better way to produce and deliver affordable, nutritious food for all Americans. Around our vital table tonight, or our, our vital and virtual table, we have four people who've been leaders for years in reforming the food system in New York and beyond. They know the history, they know what connections need repair across the food chain. They know the strategies that taken together can transform the nation's food system on the scale the original New, G New Deal achieved in another era. Dr. Jan Poppendick is Professor Emeritus at Hunter College a founder of its Food Policy Center and author of books on New Deal food policy and contemporary issues, and an activist for today's hunger relief efforts. Kate McKenzie has directed since 2019 the Mayor's Office of Food Policy in New York City. Kate's team produced a 10-year food plan for the city when COVID struck, and when COVID struck, her staff quickly deployed a wide range of emergency programs to relieve hunger and shore up food banks and restaurants. Annette Nielsen is acting director of the New York City Food Policy Center at Hunter College in Manhattan. She formally led the city office of New York State's Department of Agriculture and Markets, part of a long career and engagement in all aspects of the food system. Myron Thurston is a marketing specialist for the Cornell Cooperative Extension in New York's Mohawk Valley. He's a hands-on leader, helping upstate farmers and livestock producers there and bringing more of their products to consumers in New York City. Myron grew up on his family's 100-year-old dairy farm in Oneida County in New York, New York. And as Harold said, the only one in this place <laughs> right now is I think milk a cow. Tonight, we've asked each of you to share brief opening uh, comments, drawing on your work. Then we'll move to a roundtable exchange on applying those lessons to the next farm bill and other efforts. And we invite those of you watching at home to put your questions uh, to our guests in the chat. We'll answer as many as we can before we close at 8.30. Uh, Dr. Poppendick will start us off, Jan. So if we can have the first slide. Um, I have called this uh, talk, the federal response to food insecurity. And food insecurity is kind of my part of the, the food system as it were. Um, and the second slide, the federal response is enormous at, in the current state. In a recent year, one out of four Americans participated in at least one of USDA's 15 federal food assistance programs. USDA spent $182.5 billion on food assistance in fiscal 2021, um, three quarters of its budget, and more than 40 million Americans are, uh, participated in the SNAP program in an average month. Um, I want to, next slide, to tell you a story about how we got into, how the New Deal came to engage 
in food assistance directly. Um, Harold mentioned uh, the conundrum of, of our time being this contrast between food going to waste under some circumstances and people going hungry. Um, but in the New Deal era, in the, in the Great Depression, it was an enormous part um, of the way people experienced the, the Depression. Um, and really the story begins at the, during World War I when farmers were encouraged by the government to expand American agricultural production to meet food needs of our European allies. And many of them mortgaged their farms and homes in order to bring new additional land into production. And then the war was over and the European market for American farm products collapsed. Um, and farm, Congress canceled the war credits um, so Europeans could not purchase the food they needed. And this kicked off a cycle in which American farmers were laboring um, under the burden of having produced surpluses. You know, if we got too many bicycles, why well, the nine firms that make bicycles can cut production. But there were millions of farmers and they had no way to control the output. So they all worked harder and tried to produce more. And the country was, in a sense, drowning in, um, in surpluses and farmers were losing their homes and land. Um, next slide, please. Um, tax sales and bank foreclosures um, met with resistance um, as communities and farmers tried to hang on to their land. Um, and the next slide then. Um, when the crash came and the market further shrank, um, American agriculture had been in distress all through what for the industrial folks was the roaring 20s, but when the depression hit, and people couldn't afford the, the food they need. Why, um, <laughs> you see the product of the, those cows that uh, none of us have milked except Myron. Um, but that's the, the famous dairy strike where the milk was poured out on the highways. The destruction of food dramatized the contradictions. Next slide. So it all came to a head when the Roosevelt administration um, under the terms of the new Agricultural Adjustment Act, decided to try to forestall a glut on the hog market by slaughtering 6 million baby pigs and what are called piggy sows, pregnant pigs. Um, and um, it was a public relations disaster. I'll take the next slide, please. For one thing, the pigs uh, uh, escaped. The, the stockyards were built to contain large hogs and the little pigs got out through the slats and went squealing down the streets of Omaha and um, other abattoir cities and generated a kind of public sympathy for the poor little pigs. But much more fundamentally, people were greatly distressed by the image of food being destroyed and going to waste when people were hungry in large numbers. And finally, there was the problem of the byproducts of this slaughter. The pigs that were too small for the equipment, for the processing equipment, were essentially ground up into a liquefied pig called tankage. And tankage um, can be used, can be dried and used as fertilizer. And that was a common practice in that era for the extras of the, the um, killing process. But of course, the drying facilities were quickly overwhelmed and the processors got rid of this liquefied pig as they could. They dumped it into rivers, they put it in gravel pits, they dumped it in quarries. And next slide, please. Um, oops, well, I missed one here, um, but never, don't worry about it. We'll get to this in just a second. Outside of Chicago, Chicago was the home of the Chicago Tribune, and it was a paper that was hostile to the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal. And outside of Chicago, uh, the processors had indeed dumped some of the liquefied pig into uh, gravel pits. And then the weather, weather turned hot, as it often does in September. And an enormous stench arose, and clouds of blue flies descended on the, uh, the suburbs of Chicago. And the Chicago Tribune had a, a field day attacking the administration. 
And the very next day after its scathing uh, editorial, FDR announced a new plan. Um, he directed the emergency leaf administrator, Harry Hopkins, and the Secretary of Agriculture to form a corporation to purchase the farmer's surpluses and use them for relief. So the Federal Surplus Relief Corporation was chartered in October of 1933. Um, and at that point, it became a kind of political football. It was used at first effectively to supplement federal cash relief and meet the needs of many families in need. But when the relief structure changed, the relief folks didn't want it anymore because it contradicted the, the ideology they were promulgating. Um, so it was handed over to the agriculture department and that set the pattern, okay? For the next, next slide, please. For the next um, decades, it was run largely um, to benefit farmers, and it was the commercial farmers, the large farmers who were the primary clients of the Department of Agriculture. And this meant small, inadequate programs for poor people. But as the demographics changed and the farm block power dwindled, food assistance became a crucial bargaining trip chip. Next slide, please. Um, so that when food stamps were created in 1964, it was um, gotten through the Ag Committees and Congress as a trade for wheat and cotton substitute, subsidies. And by the late 1970s, the nutrition titles, SNAP, uh, formerly known as food stamps, and the other nutrition programs were firmly linked to a trade with agriculture for farm income support. Um, next, next slide, please. So that was the that was the origin story. It was essentially an accident. If the weather hadn't turned hot, if farmers hadn't held back their big pigs and sent only the baby pigs, it, it wasn't a rational policy process. And that's the next slide. The first thing I think we need to, to be aware of as we try to intervene in this um, now enormous it, is there's a tremendous quirkiness in the American policy process. So if you were working from a model um, of a rational plan where you identify a problem and collect some data and develop a plan and sell it to Congress, um, this story is a good corrective. It often is much more a matter of grabbing and transforming some opportunity that is created by a massive malfunction um, next slide, please. So the second lesson I draw from this is that optics matter tremendously. The agricultural economists who came up with this plan um, had their heads in the clouds instead of their ears to the ground. Um, and some proposals really resonate with people and capture public um, sentiment. Next slide, please. Um, I think of farm to school as the aspect of the enormous school food programs that really generates enthusiasm. I hear a lot from people still complaining about um, the palatability issue, the way school food is, is presented. But many, many people are enthusiastic, next slide, about farm to cafeteria or farm to school. So that's one where we glom onto the optics that work. Um, I don't know if people in the audience would remember the pink slime <laughs> controversy, um, but it's also, it can be used um, by skilled ad advocates when there's a negative optic in there. It can be used to, to create an improvement in programs. Um, next slide, please. Finally, on the lessons, it power matters. We will not transform our food system without a powerful social movement. Next slide, please. Um, we need to engage young people. We need to engage stakeholders. We need to make clear to stakeholders what their stake is in the transformations we seek. Local governments are part of that, county governments, state governments for sure. One of the delights of federalism is you get a situation where um, you have federal dollars and governors and mayors recognize the importance of bringing those into their jurisdiction. Next slide, please. Um, 
I have a few specific strategy suggestions. Um, I can't occupy a public <laughs> platform without making the case for healthy school meals for all, for universal free school meals. It's not, it will not be handled in the, the farm bill, um, but probably it will be on the table again in the next child nutrition reauthorization. I think most people in this audience probably know that during the pandemic, we essentially had universal free school meals for all. And we've had it in many communities since the 2010 child nutrition reauthorization introduced the um, the the uh, community eligibility option. So we have to had lots of opportunities to do research and we know that it works. Um, the second little policy piece I want to put into the hopper is it's time to re restart the semi-annual recalculation of SNAP benefits. Now we only do it once a year. Up until 1981, we did it every six months. Um, an inflation, food price inflation has been so fast. Under the current structure, um, the, the market basket is 16 months old by the time it it recalculates. So imagine how much food price inflation there has been in the last 16 months. Um, we could create a regular semi-annual reallocation, or um, we could have a kind of, you know, in case of emergency, break glass if, if food price inflation exceeds a certain percentage in a two-month period, um, we could require re reallocation. Um, a third uh, agenda of mine is to remove the artificial barriers um, that are specific for SNAP that are specific to college students. They're built on a set of assumptions that no longer apply. And then I added build respectful alliances as a strategy guideline for us all because we're coming from different places and we have different priorities and we need to listen to each other. Um, last slide, next to last slide. Beyond my part of the food system, the food security, I want to say that it is time for us to shift the subsidies to align with my plate, with the Dietary Guidelines for America, away from the components of unhealthy, hyper-processed foods like corn, soy, and wheat, and toward the fruits and vegetables that we need to be, to be eating. Um, so I'll stop there um, and uh, turn it over to the next Person, I Thank guess you. that will be Kate. Thank you, Janet. And before we uh, move to Kate in one second, I just want to tell everybody who's joining us that they can put their questions in the Q&A function on the bottom of their Zoom screens. Now, Kate McKenzie. Thanks so much, Jeff. And um, Jan, always so, so great to hear from you and learn from you. Um, I have milked a cow. Um, growing up in the middle of Pennsylvania, um, I actually had many uh, classmates whose families were uh, were dairy farmers and other forms of farmers. And I will also share that in my high school anatomy and physiology class, one of my classmates unfortunately had a stillborn calf on a particular morning. And in that time we were able to, um, I overcame my uh, fear of blood because we dissected that cow and that then set me on my path towards, um, towards medicine and going to Cornell and studying nutritional sciences. So in some way, maybe it's the cows that got me onto this path of, um, <laughs> of food and nutrition in some way. Um, but uh, I have the honor and responsibility of serving as executive director of the mayor's office of food policy to advance Mayor Adams food policy vision. And I couldn't be more proud to do that. A little bit about the current time that we are in. Um, I really want to acknowledge that, yes, we are still in the grips of a pandemic, but we are also beyond the height of that pandemic, and that feels extraordinary. We're continuing to experience the impacts of the pandemic and then those that result from the pandemic. As you mentioned, just a yesterday, SNAP or food stamps, temporary benefits that were made available through the pandemic ended. That's a very real fact for more than a million and a half New York City residents. There's also glimmers of possibilities with the Farm Bill, as well as many investments from the federal and state governments in food system infrastructure. 
But let's talk just a minute, just to recall about how I feel New York City really set the bar for food policy in our COVID response, as you mentioned. We instituted a program called Get Food in which, quite frankly, anyone who needed food got food. There was a focus on culture. No questions were asked. We focused on quality and intentionality about transitioning off of that program. We also really tried to support local businesses as well as local farms. Also through the pandemic, we started something that still is in practice called a regional food working group. The origins of that group were in the beginning days of the pandemic. You might remember how, how did we move across state lines? How were trucks to be able to, uh, to, to show that they could cross a state line? And were they going to be welcomed? We, our Department of City Planning's regional planning team started talking with New Jersey, with, New, with Pennsylvania and other states who were coming into our Hunts Point market to make sure that they were able to do that. We now continue those conversations and focus on perhaps the raw data that the city has about what we're purchasing to signal to the markets about if you'd like to do business with us, how we can continue to engage in that. We currently convene USDA and the State Department of Agriculture and Markets to talk about our regional food business center grant opportunities. This demonstrates how small investments in the you know, relatively soft infrastructure to create and maintain spaces where stakeholders can exchange information and build capacity for collective actions really does matter. You mentioned we created the city's first ever 10 year food policy plan. We didn't take a beat, we didn't take a pause during the pandemic, but rather captured those lessons to really focus on food policy in its most comprehensive sense. Five goals, right, that have overarching implications, really focusing on access to healthy, affordable, culturally appropriate food, focusing on our city's food economy and economic opportunity, thinking about our food workers, thinking about the childcare needs of those workers who continue to go to work around the clock. We focused on the supply chain that feeds New York City, ensuring that it's modern, efficient, and resilient. We really took a look at an examination of the food that's produced, distributed, and disposed of, and wanting to make sure that that was done with as a lens towards sustainability. And then finally, making sure that we as a city are supporting the systems and knowledge to implement a 10-year food policy plan, exchanging ideas, hearing from stakeholders about how we're doing, and also the ideas that we haven't gotten right just yet. But I also want to talk a little bit about what we will talk about on this call, which is truly strategies for food systems transformation. This is what um, and Mayor Adams' food policy is all about, food systems transformation. We are intentionally working to influence and then change consumer food preferences and eating behaviors. From plant-based defaults in our public hospital system, that's right, in our public hospital system, if you are a patient, a plant-based meal is the default option. Of course, if that's not for you, you have the choice to get something else, but trying to make the healthy choice the easy choice is what's driving our actions. Introducing plant-powered Fridays in schools. And this is particularly uh, a key for me who I have two public school students in my household who give me reviews every single day. We've also introduced fresh produce into the city's emergency food distribution program for the first time. And we've set new food standards for all meals and food that the city procures and serves. In this administration, we also understand and acknowledge the food and climate connections, working with our chief climate officer, our Office of Climate and Environmental Justice to determine strategies to combat the real challenges that our food system plays in the face of climate change. The city's had a very significant investment in Grow NYC's regional food hub that's estimated to move 20 million pounds of food each year, most of which will come from regional farms. Jeff, you mentioned Hunts Point. We've invested $40 million in the renovation of that center, that food distribution center that includes creating family sustaining jobs 
enhancing community health and access to healthy food, promoting environmental justice through the systems and practices there and delivering upgrades to open space, transportation and other key community infrastructures. The city is investing in social protection programs and supporting the affordability, not just the access of free food, but the affordability of healthy diets for all from a new program called Groceries to Go that took the best of our experiences over the pandemic and made a permanent program to that community uh, emergency food program called Community Food Connection, which has a groundbreaking $53 million investment. Health Bucks, a long standing and proven program to help support farmers as well as double the impact of SNAP in farmers markets. And again, really doubling down on childcare, because let's face it, if families can't safely and with security put their kids into childcare, how can they go to work? How can they then get, have incomes to put food on the table? These examples illustrate the importance of supportive government policy. Certainly food system outcomes depend on choices by producers and consumers, but governments have a responsibility to influence those choices with nudges and other incentives. I'm really proud of the work of this administration and the mayor's office of food policy to be effective at coordinating across all levels of government to demonstrate our interest and support for a vibrant regional food system. We certainly have a lot of opportunities with the farm bill, but there's many other opportunities as well. Certainly, from the uh, the America the uh, the stimulus plans, the strategies for food systems transformations that USDA has laid out that will ripple triple down into our New York City economy. Also, want to acknowledge the role of the mayor's office, the new mayor's office of urban agriculture, and my colleague Kiana Mickey, who is a, a key partner and again helping to support both from community gardens to urban farms to food businesses that support the growing and selling of food in the city. It's a great time for food policy here and I'm really eager for this conversation. Thank you, Kate. Uh, the mayor uh, has, our current mayor in New York City has talked extensively about how changing his own diet saved his life. It's been very interesting. We now move to Annette Nielsen of Hunter College's Food Policy Center. Annette. Thanks so much, Jeff. and. Um... Thanks for the introduction. I appreciate being included on this panel with Jan and Kate and Myron. I've got a little bit to say about food systems. Um, I feel like I've been in, in some part of production to consumption um, for a good part of my working career. And um, we can start with the slides if you like. Um, next slide, please. This is you know a typical upstate farm, right? I have also milked cows and sheep and I've processed chickens and a few other animals. <laughs> so, um, but I, I applaud um, Myron for, for his extensive work because he probably had to get up seven days a week doing the milking. So we, we're lucky to live in a state with an incredibly diverse agrarian economy. We grow most everything that you might ever want to eat in this state. Um, next slide, please. Um, well, we're, the U.S. is third globally in agricultural production. New York State really contributes a lot to that process. In 2021, we produced over $3 billion in the gross domestic product, paying close to a billion dollars in wages. We're a top 10 national producer of many areas like milk and apples and grapes and maple syrup and onions and sweet corn. Um, dairy is certainly our biggest economic sector of our farm economy. And with that, we have 33,000 farms, mostly family farms, right? On over 7 million acres of land that take up about 20% of our state's total land area. Um, next slide, please. So when I worked um, for Ag and Markets, the commissioner, Commissioner Ball, convened a procurement advisory group. And they came up with a report of recommendations that was um, delivered to the governor at the end of 2022. So I'm, I'm going to be bringing in pieces of that report too, because I think it's important in this discussion. So this is just a diagram of kind of all the elements that you might see um, that make up our food system from production to consumption. Next slide, please. 
So this is Brian Reeves. He was a member of the Procurement Advisory Group, um, a fifth generation uh, vegetable farmer in upstate New York, just outside of Syracuse and Baldwinsville. Um, and he not only sells at his farm stand, next slide, please. He also sells at the nearby Central New York Regional Market Authority. This was a WPA initiative that opened um, in 1938. Um, and you know it's it's a great um, area that is still going now, and it's it's uh, serving about ten counties in New York State. Next slide, please. So this is the market today. Um, expanded certainly um, it exists on about I don't know how many acres, but it's it's huge. And it uh, is this picture doesn't tell it all, but it is in disrepair. And their executive director, Amanda Vitale, is trying to identify some funding sources to upgrade the sheds, HVAC, um, you know, refrigeration, all of all of the things necessary for a regional food hub. And she says, you know, this building served the purpose it was intended in 1938, and it's even more important today in light of COVID and supply chain issues. Next slide, please. So the Reeves family also sells um, to uh, the, the food hub in the Bronx for NYC's food hub. And, you know, that food from that point goes, you know, that farm food goes to many different places in New York City, that last mile. Um, it could land with a grocery store or market restaurant or with institutional chefs like Frank Walren, pictured here, who works with Bronx Works. Next slide, please. So um, as Kate mentioned, you know, Grand YC has, has, you know, they're expanding. They have received funding for an upgraded facility. Um, this regional food hub is scheduled to open later this year, green building, and, you know, hoping at capacity to increase their service to 60 farmers in the Northeast to more than 150 regional farmers when they're at capacity. Next slide, please. So this is also part of the um, procurement advisory group's recommendations. And I'm not going to go through each one of these areas because it's it's lengthy and in depth, but I will in include you know, um, access to the report that you can be found online um, at the Ag and Markets website um, in the chat later on. But you know, these key areas where we can see changes. Um, or maybe ask for changes in our food system and the infrastructure, you know, we start with workforce development. We know we have labor shortages all across the entirety of the agri-food value chain. Um, so we need a collaborative effort to work on this, whether it's Department of Education, um, Department of Corrections, Department of Aging, um, as well as New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. The housing area is key too. Um, we need affordable housing, we need safe housing and maybe even subsidized housing when necessary. When you look at Long Island, you know, that's one of the biggest barriers uh, for, for people to, to find farm workers is the housing area because it's so expensive. Land access. If you talk to any farmer, you will always hear them say they don't make any more of it, meaning land, soil, farmland, right? Um, so hang on to what you've got. It, it's, it, it's a truth. Um, transportation certainly is key. You know, we need to invest more in our roads, bridges, railways, ports, you know, and explore perhaps other means of transport, maybe like light rail or boats on major waterways. Food hubs, we've, we've touched on that. Um, and then technical assistance for food processors. You know, how do you do farm to freezer um, to extend, you know, produce throughout the year, right? East End Farm Institute on Long Island is doing a really good job in a lot of these areas too. Um, equitable food access. Um, you know, this would involve, you know, facilitating better communication between farmers and institutions to guide growers planting plans and incentivize a diverse range of products from small scale producers um, to meet larger institutional needs across the state. Next slide, please. So this is another, uh, diagram from the procurement report. Um, and I'm just gonna touch on a couple of areas here. During the pandemic, and in fact, on I think it was April 27th, we were looking at some figures today at the office, um, the Nourish New York launched. Um, it was really important at the time that it happened. I mean, farmers upstate were dumping dairy, you know, some of the cooperatives, um, you know, and food wasn't getting to New York City at that point. So 
funding was made available so that uh, farmers got paid and food got to where it was needed most at the food banks. Um, that amount of money really was helpful at the time. And as of November 21st, it's now codified. So we have $50 million a year that goes into Nourish New York, which is really, I think, one of the most brilliant um, pieces of legislation that we've had. Um, and then I'm also going to just pull in here too, because Kate touched on, on the importance of urban agriculture. You know, Urban Farms and Community Gardens grant came, came through the Department of Agriculture and Markets and that's gonna be rolling out and really identifies urban agriculture as an important part of the food system, especially in places like New York City. Next slide, please. Um, here we have a picture of um, Congressman Jim uh, McGovern. He was one of the facilitators of the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. And a few months back, he made a visit uh, to the New Roots Farm in New York City. It's part of the International Rescue Committee Initiative. And he met here with the New York City Director of Urban Ag, Kiana Mickey. Um, and I will just say, you know, for the first time in our city, we have both federal, state, and, and local representation for urban agriculture, agriculture in general, right? So on the federal level, the FSA is going to be opening up a new office shortly. State, of course, we have New York State Department of Ag and Markets. And then on the local, we have the inaugural office of the mayor's office of urban ag. So it's a really exciting time I see as, you know, we have these three entities, you know, seemingly, you know, working to push the needle forward and make a difference. Um, next slide, please. And I'll just say, you know, this White House conference hadn't happened since 1969. This is only the second one of its kind. And it's, you know, I know many people, including the Congressman McGovern, really have been pushing hard to have this happen. Um, so it, it, it does lead to the fact that we need, it's important to ask people who are running for office to put food and agriculture on their platforms. <laughs> it's It's not just getting out to vote, it's really trying to encourage them to make these sorts of um, you know, initiatives important. Next slide, please. So you know, when we look at the Farm Bill, that's part of the congressional agenda. And Jan, you, you really spoke really directly to that. And um, you know, it's the 18th Farm Bill. There are 200 plus members of Congress who've never worked on a Farm Bill before. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, we have... Um, you know, Senator Debbie Stabenow is still still on it, um, but this will be her last because she's not running for re-election in 2024. But immigration is another topic that's key to our, our food system, um, um, may or may not be addressed this round, um, and supply chain issues. We need to address these infrastructure needs, right? Um, next, next slide, please. So beyond those tangible and the physical infrastructure investments that we need, we also need to invest in resources for individuals to access information. And we can go quickly through the next slides, but this is where the center comes in. Um, and Jan, thank you for being part of starting this um, institution and place that I, I now get to work and I feel very honored to be here, thank you. Um, but at the center, you know, that's been going for over a decade now, you know, we work with diverse groups of stakeholders and believe that food policies are not simply regulations imposed by the government, right? There's a lot of good work to be done. Next slide, please. So we have, you know, 59 community districts and we have a neighborhood food resource guide for each one. And these are really important in that they include, you know, an aggregated list of grocery stores, whether or not those stores accept SNAP and WIC, food pantries, soup kitchens, older adult centers, substance abuse resources, farmers markets, social services, and more. And these are updated on a daily basis so they don't get stale yeah. and old. Um, next slide, please. And, you know, I'll just run through these quickly. We also have a weekly uh, Food Policy Watch newsletter that goes out. Next slide, please. We're working on a SNAP screening tool for college students that should be rolling out later this year. Hyperlocal Health, um, another initiative that also draws on our neighborhood resource guides. Next slide, please. And within that, we did a um, rollout of a, a pilot for Food for East Harlem. We hope to be able to replicate that in other parts of the city. Next slide. And then we also work collaborati uh, collaboratively on studies with other academic institutions like the Lori M. Tisch Center and CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Next slide. Next slide. 
one more, thanks. And then we hope to continue to roll out our food policy um, for breakfast seminars um, yeah. coming up this year. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Annette. And uh, we're gonna move to Myron Thurston of Cornell. We're getting a lot of good questions in the Q&A. Place any questions at the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Myron Thurston, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me with this really august group of uh, speakers tonight. I uh, work with Cornell Cooperative Extension, and my position is paid for via the New York State Assembly. Um, and my job is to help upstate New York farmers bring their goods into the New York City marketplace. Uh, and we've really benefited from many of the programs that have already been discussed tonight, with Nourish New York being one that has really made a big impact that I'll talk about in just a moment. So just the process, you think early COVID, you know, store shelves were empty um, and it happened to be that Catalina Cruz um, from Queens and Marianne Buttonchan from our area, who are both in the assembly, had offices next to each other. And uh, Marianne was talking about how farmers were dumping milk and plowing, uh, you know, onions underneath the ground to let them rot. And Catalina was talking about two to three mile long lines to get boxes of food. And they got together and decided to uh, work with the governor's office to uh, implement Nourish New York. And um, we, along with that, they got an additional line item uh, uh, grant for, to hire me to kind of help manage the process for farmers to get their food into the supply chain. Because as things sit right now, it's very difficult for a, a small farmer who is perhaps selling at a farm stand or at a farmer's market to then get their food into the larger food system. What I also wanted to understand better was how we could serve um, people who were food insecure in New York City. I, my background after milking cows, as was mentioned, uh, was raising money for not-for-profits and specifically community not-for-profits. So uh, hunger is a big deal for me to, to try to help with. And so we started to learn about how food was distributed, where we could insert ourselves into the supply chain in order to be able to provide healthy, nutritious, and fresh food from New York State farmers. And so when we talk about why the New York State farmers needed someone like me to help them with getting their goods uh, to the New York City marketplace, the first is there is not a really strong supply chain from upstate New York to New York City. Uh, there was in the 1930s and 40s, but that's gone away because New York City buys most of its food from around the country and around the world. Um, and it, what has also happened during that time is it's become a little bit more expensive for farmers in New York State to, um, to operate in general. Our, our labor costs are a little bit higher, land and taxes are usually a little bit higher. So what we were looking for was opportunities for farmers to come in close to those uh, international conglomerates, but we really can't beat them on price, though we can talk for a long time about what the quality means. Um, so, and we also are competing in New York City against the biggest food companies in the world, um, which many of those companies are driven by shareholder profit and not working with farmers to make sure that they're successful. Um, what's also interesting to know is the share of the food dollar today that actually goes to the farmer who raised or grew or whatever is about 19%. Whereas in the 1939, late 1930s, it was over 40%. And you know, when we think about when subsidies first started in the United States for farmers through the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which was part of the New Deal, that was really to help dairy farmers who had all of this extra production. Interesting uh, side note, that's where government cheese comes from because they had so much milk that they needed to process into something. And so they made a whole bunch of cheese and stored it in warehouses. So as part of the process of understanding how we could help distribute food in New York City, uh, I went down and spent some time at different uh, food distribution sites. This is Monk Works Food Pantry in Jackson Heights in Queens. Um, we also went to the La Jornada Food Pantry. Uh, this is at the Queens Museum where they had a food distribution site. And we also started talking with a lot of the people in the New York City food system. 
And so uh, we had an opportunity to have a really successful, a really good success story early on um, with La Jornada's Thanksgiving uh, food distribution. They helped about 15,000 people in um, Thanksgiving of 2021, but about four days before the event happened, um, we got a, a distressed call from the food bank and they said, our, our turkey donor backed out. So this is one week before Thanksgiving. As you can imagine, turkeys are somewhat hard to come by at that time of year. And they needed 5,000 of them in four days delivered to a parking lot in New York City. And um, we were able to, with our, our partner, Mosner Family Brands in the Bronx, um, at, at Hunts Point, we were able to find 5,000 chickens, not turkeys, but 5,000 chickens, um, that were in a canceled order that happened to be sitting in a freezer and we were able to get them there to help feed 15,000 people that day. So that was a really cool opportunity to see the work that we're doing in action. And that was also the same day that the governor signed the permanent extension of the Nourish New York program. So um, one of our other really big success stories that I'm super excited about, and one of our other speakers was uh, Nat was the one that introduced me to Anna Hammond with Matriarch Food, really illustrates how we can all work together to make our food system stronger and also to serve hungry people in New York City at the same time. So Anna, uh, via Annette, reached out to me and said, hey, I'm going to be making this shelf-stable vegetable stew that we could serve in food uh, banks around New York City, but we also could serve in many other places. But I would need to source New York State goods because I wanted to qualify for the Nourish New York program. And the Nourish New York program was started during COVID uh, in tranches of $25 million that went to food banks. And the only thing that they were required to do was buy New York State goods with that money, right? So a whole new industry was started at that point of serving food banks with New York State food. So we were able to get a conference call together with New York State Ag and Markets, Upstate Growers and Packers near me, Headwater Food Hub in Rochester, and the River Fund, which serve, who serves about 30,000 uh, people in Queens. And we all sat around the table and said, how can we make this work? Here's our list of ingredients that we need. Uh, and we were able to source all of that or enough of it to qualify for Nourish New York from Upstate New York farmers. Our prototype run should go in March. Uh, for 100,000 servings. And then what's really exciting about this is it's upcycled vegetables, meaning it's all the stuff that's normally thrown away on a farm. Um, what people don't know is about 40% of our food waste is on-farm food waste. So if we can capture more of that, we can really eliminate a ton of food waste. And we have, there's a whole bunch of other opportunities out there too that we're working with. The Nourish New York program, as I've mentioned, uh, the farm to school program around New York State is incredibly exciting as we see more and more school systems signing up. Buffalo City Schools is now uh, one of the leaders in the country with sourcing locally, uh, and we're hopeful that New York City Schools will be able to participate in that program at some point. We're looking at traditional distribution networks, so we've worked with companies like Baldor's Fine Foods to look at how we can insert more New York State goods into their supply chain. Um, we're partnering with companies like Grubhub and Whole Foods. So Grubhub uh, has a foundation where they pay to have meals made for food insecure families. We want to encourage those restaurants that would make the food to buy New York State food. Uh, increased focus by Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams on where government entities procure their food. And another grant that I'm working on with food hubs around the state so that we can help farmers get their food into the supply chain. We also, I would be remiss not to bring up all the help that we've had from elected officials from all over the state. Um, my program has been put in for another year that would get me through the end of 2024 to continue to work on this uh, project. But we all met at Baldors in Hunts Point to try to talk about how we could better serve families in Queens and around the state with New York State goods. And we've also been to events like the uh, Farm Bureau event at the Queens County Farm Museum, where we're talking with our colleagues from downstate about how we can do a better job of providing fresh food to your residents. And then I, the last thing that I wanted to mention is all the things that Cornell does. I'm part of a much, much larger system. And so we have Harvest New York, which is working with Farm to School, 
Cornell Small Farms, which works with small farmers and education. We have a brand new office of urban farming in New York City, um, which seems to be like everybody here has a new office. So we will have to find ways to work together. And um, we really are trying to be a leader in helping schools with procuring their food from New York State. So thank you all for a few minutes of your time tonight. Thanks, Myron. Well, we're, uh, questions are coming in again on the Q&A, and we'll get to those in a few minutes. I have a question um, motivated by the pandemic, which is, of course, sort of the leitmotif of our lives the last three years. I got calls from legislators I know well, some I never knew well, from New York City, the rest of New York State, and about 17 other states who were in a panic to try and deliver food themselves, including schlepping the actual deliveries. This, these are sitting legislators. Do you think the pandemic actually concentrated minds uh, nationally and in New York in ways that help propel the programs that you've all offered here as models and good models? Or are we back, I, sometimes I feel we're back to square one in some sense, even though we were all talking about the plight of food workers too, and who had to work during the pandemic. Anybody? So, so I'll, I'll jump in on that one because I, I uh, Catalina Cruz, uh, who is a assembly member from Queens, if you were to look at her legislative history, before COVID, it was criminal justice reform and it was focused on biz, small businesses, the things that you would normally think of uh, an assembly member from inner city Queens focusing on. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and she was responsible for delivering something like, it was a crazy number, like a half a million meals she was involved with serving to her residents. And immediately after that, it was you know, working on Nourish New York and helping find funding for someone to help bring more healthy food from upstate New York into New York City. So you could really see, you know, we're so lucky to get the chance to work with her, but you could really see that that changed her focus, seeing people lined up at the Queens Museum literally for miles waiting for a box of food. Um, I mean, I, you would hope you would think that would change anyone. So, And I'll build on that because I think Jeff, you're illustrating also the reason why we couldn't take a pause and needed to write food forward because the connections around food policy that restaurants are a form of food policy and the supports to restaurants, certainly supporting um, our, our regional farm economy connected to restaurants who that were a great source of, of food flows coming into the city. Um, all, everyone that used to rely on restaurants suddenly had to think about where their meals were coming from. But also, you know, who would have thought, and I think it's like three years almost to the day, right, where the, you know, I vividly remember, um, you know, the first for the city, it was thinking about senior centers, but then it was like, no, we have to think bigger than that. The schools are going to close. What if nobody can leave their home, right? And so thinking about um, populations that were not as prominent, particularly homebound elderly, um, who post pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and certainly after the pandemic, continue to be real um, populations of need that aren't quite as visible, right? And so I think, you know, again, um, a real great success was a, a program called the Pandemic EBT Program. I received, in fact, I showed this earlier today, I still carry the cards, Every public school parent received, uh, became essentially beneficiaries of public benefits. So the experience of not knowing when your card is loaded, how do I use it, showing the public card, all of this became sort of um, a, a real experience for, for most, for parents in New York City. And you became to realize the um, experience of utilizing public benefits, but also how easy it could be and how for many people who have to rely on the SNAP program, the experience of applying, the experience of figuring out and recertifying for those programs. Government actually worked really well during the pandemic, particularly in food assistance, and how we're able to capitalize and, and, and keep some of those best ofs in quote blue skies, or I'll call it gray skies because we're not really in the blue skies yet. Um, I think those are some of the opportunities and how, again, we capitalize on the reality of food 
policy is pervasive. It's about supporting good jobs. It's about supporting access, availability, and desirability of food. Um, a lot of the uh, discussion right before the pandemic about New York State agriculture often centered in the press on viniculture and yogurt. <laughs> Nothing against yogurt and wine. I like both. But I was wondering if you think that the consciousness, of course, we've lost a lot of the press too. So the coverage of these wonderful programs in New York and elsewhere seems to be hard to find often, despite everybody's good efforts. This is not a criticism of anybody here. Um, and at the same time, in urban areas like New York, I attend funerals for supermarkets, plain vanilla, unionized supermarkets with the United Food and Commercial Workers, and even when the owners sometimes have joined us. And people still tell me it's harder, it's hard for them to access fresh food. So um, these efforts that you've all mentioned sh uh, will make it easier and are, are making it easier. But do you think, the? I guess my question is, um, what are we not doing in advocacy communities that would help propel some of these programs along faster? I mean, because you've also mentioned land use. We don't have a direct, we can get freight rail down from upstate New York. We don't have a direct rail freight connection to New York City from the other side of the Hudson. I mean, we have, there's also logistics and infrastructure problems that we discovered during the pandemic that were illuminated by the pandemic that we knew about. Yeah, I'll just step in on this one. I mean, I, for as an adult, lived for about 11 years in upstate New York and Washington County, which is a big agricultural community. And, you know, in our local K-12 school, which was also a WPA initiative, um, beautiful school, um, we were tr trying to get more of the local food into the school cafeteria tried and tried and tried right and i i i even convened groups of um, cafeteria workers with local farmers to see if we could get them both around the table in a growing you know situation so that more things were planted you know maybe a little bit later in the season so to align with the school calendar right because not all those things line up but our local potato grower for example he was sixth generation um you know, when we were talking about bringing just potatoes into our cafeteria, he was maybe an, a mile and a half um, from the school, had gone to the school. And yeah. when it came time for him to deliver, he said to me, Annette, he's like, you know, I have to take off an hour, basically, to load up the truck, to bring the school 50 pounds of potatoes, because that's about all they could take at that point, right? And unload, because there was no one to unload at the other end, right? And, you know, and then drive back and maybe I'll have someone else on my route, but it wasn't, you know, cost effective for him. It wasn't sustainable for someone who was a farmer who really cared about the community and wanted that food to be in the local school. So, you know, that whole structure around getting food to where it needs to get, you know, whether it's a van or a truck or a boat coming down the Hudson, a barge, you know, I mean, it's like we need to think creatively around the ways we do this and 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 whether it's subsidies to to make that happen i don't know i mean you know because if if a, a potato farmer can't get his food 2 miles away you know reasonably um, we better do better i always ask my local green market farmers you know usually on saturdays when we have it in my block how long did it take you to get in? What were the logistics costs? And it's funny how, you know, we're, we're discussing congestion road pricing. We're discussing all the things Ned just mentioned, just physically getting the, the milk example that we heard in the pandemic. I don't want to keep dwelling on the pandemic. We'll move along. But um, they, they actually are very interesting in coming up with some solutions. I said, what would make your life easier? And there were a couple of farmers in the Catskills said, get me a direct rail freight connection I, it just has to be two trains a day, and we could do that. It may not even have to be seven days a week, even four days a week would help us. So, you know, when I think about food, I have to think about all these other logistical and infrastructure issues. On the climate change issue that we're touched on now, we hear a lot of uh, 
you know, echoes of the Dust Bowl and the New Deal and all those films we used to watch as, uh, certainly I used to watch as a kid, it seemed very remote. And now it seems, uh, you know, as vivid as our own, vivid, it's vivid. <laughs> um, how is that, um, some of you mentioned climate change briefly, how is New York in terms of connecting what we grow in the Hudson Valley, what's left of agriculture on Long Island, Western and Northern New York, dealing with that? And um, is it hobbling at all the connection that we want to build, that you're all building between urban consumption and the production areas of the state? Well, I'll jump in a little bit on that. Um, because the good food purchasing movement, if you if it's fair to call it that, is really an attempt to address not only climate and environment, but community, economic health, the um, wages and protections for workers, a valued workforce, the health of the food system, and the treatment of animals, animal welfare within stated values and you know new york is making um progress and kate would be in a better position than i to to let us know how how far we've gotten but it it's a pretty major shift in consciousness for entities that do large scale purchasing and you know one of the reasons i got involved with school food was because I was imagining just how much food we're talking about if you've got 30 million kids participating 180 days a, a year or so. Um, so to purchasing procurement has been dominated by the fear of corruption and therefore an insistence on lowest bid for generations, for decades. And now we are beginning to be able to take into account other values, things that are important besides price, um, so that the local uh, procurement provisions in the, in the school food uh, arena, um, the ability to pay attention to climate impact and other sustainability issues. So I think we're on the edge of a, um, a brave new world, if you will, in that. Maybe that's a, too negative a term, but the edge of of a real change in, in public procurement, but we're lagging. I mean, climate change and the many climate and weather disasters that you know have become a part of our nightly news entertainment um, are are happening faster than than we're taking the action that would would prevent them. So, you know, there's a plus and a minus here. But I do think that the good food purchasing, which impacts, we didn't talk about it specifically, but all of you mentioned things that are really part of this good food purchasing initiative. What about efforts to assist farmers? When I'm in Albany, I, you know, I've had many discussions with actual farmers who come up for lobby days when we're overlapping in shifting to, um, products that might be better suited for what's happening to their land or livestock. And um, also might, I, this is, you know, might be easily, more easily transportable if that's even relevant. So one of the ways that we can ad advantage New York State farmers is by building bids that are goods that are, are much better grown here in New York. So for example, we're working with um, uh, DFAS and, and their procurement process, and we're gonna look at trying to include maybe apple strains that only are in New York, right? So it's, you, you, you know, it's an opportunity for farmers from New York to bid on that particular, like empire apples, let's say, for example, or creative ways like there's a reasonableness clause in New York City procurement um, that says they can pay up to 10% more for goods based on where they come from or other values beyond price, right? So how do we help farmers get their food to New York City within 10% of the cost of what international conglomerates are doing? And that's really where, as we continue to build food systems and 
You see a lot of money that, you know, uh, uh, President Biden has signed into law to go towards the USDA to build food systems stronger around the country. We're going to see a lot of grants around that and how to make local food hubs that are buying direct from farmers, aggregating the goods, and then taking the, the problem of shipping away from the farmer. Because the farmer wants to farm. They don't want to spend their day figuring out logistics, right? So... We have a lot of uh, questions here from our audience. Um, uh, here's one that I never thought of from Miriam. Uh, France has passed laws against food waste. Uh, could we do that in New York City or New York State? Literally just pass a law. But I know I work with the Solid Waste Advisory Board sometimes in Manhattan, they have projects on that, but I didn't know there was a law against them. Is that even possible? I do know what I will say is that, um, you know, Mayor Adams announced in the state of the city that the curbside composting is coming back in full effect. Um, and there has been some extraordinary success with a pilot in Queens um, that is really making uh, uh, composting across the borough at the household level on streets particularly um, accessible. So I won't go into the legalities of uh, requiring it, but I certainly know that ro rolling out the program citywide um, that was pulled back during the pandemic, but expanding that to new and different ways is scheduled to, um, to come as soon as the fall. And here's a question from Lorraine who grew up, she says, in post-World War II South Bronx near the Hunts Point Market. Um, some of you had mentioned community-based food programs and initiatives. She wants to know what's being done at the micro level, and this harks back to the original New Deal, uh, to translate proposals mentioned into boots on the ground programs that include food and nutrition education, as with the programs that existed in her youth in the 50s and 60s at local health stations run by registered nurses and nutritionists. Well, I didn't know the, about that. <laughs> one of the many reasons to move to universal free school meals, as we have in New York City, is because then you really can integrate food education with it's a it's a it's a heavy lift. It's a we're not there yet for the most part. But once you have the meal available to all children, you know, free of charge, you can integrate it with the with the curriculum in the classroom. Um, so. There's also some programs that help with. Uh, encouraging people to buy safe from farmers markets. There's double up food bucks, which uh, uh, doubles your purchasing power at farmers markets that's run throughout New York State. Um, and there's other programs that help encourage people to uh, buy healthier food, like the food is medicine movement, where a doctor writes a prescription for their uh, the patient to eat more healthy foods, right? And, you know, so th there is a lot of really out of the box thinking going on around encouraging people to eat healthier. And you know, I'm really excited to see where that leads. I, um, there's a question here also about um, subsidizing farm worker housing on Long Island when there is so much more land, I guess. This is, uh, elsewhere in New York State. Well, that reminds me of that film Farmingville, where people interviewed on Long Island who were longtime residents kind of wanted the people outrageously who worked picking or packing or shipping their food from the agricultural sector on Long Island to disappear. Yeah. So this is also an immigration question. Many of you have mentioned that we want to integrate are all our populations in New York in a new food system? Uh, so Molly's question about is whether Long Island is the most efficient place to do that? Well, we also get more than just produce. Um, you know, out from Long Island, there's the whole fisheries side of things that we don't see in, you know, say in the central Adirondacks. <laughs> you, know, you might get some trout up there, but um, you know, it's it's not it's not that same marketplace. And so, you know, it is fertile land in Long Island. I think you know, there's there are a lot of good projects going on. I was just out there um, a couple months ago. Um, and you do see, I mean, I was, 
driving into this conference and kind of cutting across the East End. And, you know, there's the traffic that is coming from the West um, out there at 530 in the morning is amazing. But it's, and it's all people who are working in service roles. And, you know, it's it's not just farming and food service, it's everything. So, you know, it's it's an indicator of, you know, how housing, yes, I mean, we need to to probably expand, you know, farming opportunities or growing opportunities or food businesses all throughout the state, but um, the fact remains there is a lot still going on in Long Island and housing is a barrier. Oysters and shellfish out there. And I remember years ago, John Klein, who was a Republican County executive, had a land protection program. I think it was in the in 70s, early 70s, because they, they were dealing with uh, development and overdevelopment of existing agricultural land. And then it wasn't just duck farms. It was, you know, it was other, other uh, forms of produce that they grew there. Um, I we used to talk about food co-ops, food cooperatives as a solution to getting local food to people that was fresh. I've certainly belonged to them. Ours were set up and break down, nothing like the gigantic Park Slope Food Co-op. Does anybody talk about that these days? Yes. There's a lot, there's a many, many um, active food co-ops. I do think, Jeff, it, it sort of butts up against the question you raised about um, grocery stores closing too. You know, there's there's the um, the cost of doing business in New York City and many of the models that some of the uh, food co-ops are taking are starting as nonprofits, right? So the to, to really... Um, support the business models where you have to pay for the space that you're in. That's sort of the vicious cycle of um, that gets to the, again, the business models to be able to sustain low cost membership, low cost food um, met with needs of paying people as well as paying the rent and everything else. So, but there is a, you know, and I, I don't think this movement has gone away in, I don't know, the 15 years or so that I've been been following it. The success, you know, like we're not going to see something. Um, I I would be great to see another Park Slope food co-op type model, but there are a number of um, uh, uh, you know smaller ventures in parts of Brooklyn, in parts of the Bronx um, that don't have the star power that Park Slope food co-op has. And my friends at the United Food and Commercial Workers and Retail Wholesale Workers certainly. Uh... Even if there were co-ops, they would advocate that they be organized. Um, uh, in terms of um, interagency cooperation, what can be improved beyond the food agencies that exist in the state and city? Where are their bottlenecks? What could be smoothed out? This, is this question comes from Michael. We mentioned logistics. Um, that's a, that's a very complicated question because there's, um, in fact, I was just thinking about looking at the chat and some of the questions, you know, if you think about schools, um, in, in some instances, like New York city is an administrator of a federal program. Um, and so thinking about who in, in any uh, sort of semblance of, of federal programs, typically, whether it is, uh, originating at the state or federal level, there's all different types of um, of you know the operations of it, the execution of it, the the tracking of it, all of these systems. It's not quite so easy to say just where's the simple fix. But what I will say, and I I sort of spoke to this in my opening remarks, is in my experience, never before has there been better lines of communication, open lines of communication between city, state, and federal agencies and offices that do share the same desired vision and outcomes. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, particularly as again, we're facing a real crisis of benefit reduction, but we are all trying to make sure that not just that certainly New Yorkers know that this is happening and can ideally plan and figure out ways to support the, the lack of benefits that they were having, but, you know, there's a, there's conversations and I've been, in 
you know, in experiences when those conversations weren't happening? Um, I, I inevitably, I mean, the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Program was, of course, mentioned, but inevitably the headlines this week about, you know, even work requirements for SNAP and cutbacks in other states, particularly Sunbelt states, are very distressing. We already are struggling to feed millions of Americans. And as FDR said, and invoked one third of a nation, ill-housed, ill-clad, and ill-fed. So um, how much pushback are we getting? I was reading that some of the agribusiness industries were working with some of the advocates to sort of defend SNAP. But it's a very complicated subject, and it has a lot to do with the quote undeserving poor, which is a you know not a pleasant comp you know it, and you got to work for it. It's the uh, kind of the one of the outcrops of the possessive individualist culture we live in. Um, do we have allies in stopping these cuts to SNAP that are commercial? Do we have other allies who are working? Obviously, everybody who feeds people is very hip to this problem right now. It seems incredibly urgent. Well, you know, the the food industry, the food manufacturers, the grocery industry are certainly aware. They they know how much SNAP dollars come through their their systems. And historically, they have been allies um, when it comes down to um, the farm bill um, trade-offs that go on. Um, I would hope that the, the pandemic education, if you want to call it that, the, the things that we learned as a society and as a culture from the pandemic, or that I hope we learned, um, would make the optics, again, back to that, the, of the attack on SNAP um, not well-received. Um, you know, I think there is greater sympathy for SNAP than there was before the pandemic, in part because of the kind of thing Kate described, where parents of, of children in New York City, where all children are eligible for free school meals, got the pandemic EBT benefit and had some encounter with, with it. Um, but the, the SNAP, um, mobilizing around SNAP, for the farm bill is essential. I mean, the, the role of advocates in pointing out what will happen if SNAP gets cut and what will happen not only to the, the recipients, to the people who will be hurt most immediately, but to the people who, the multiplier effect, it's uh, generally estimated at somewhere between a dollar and a half and a dollar 80 for every dollar spent um, in benefits. That's the that's the amount that goes into the community as jobs, as transportation, as view. So we know the <laughs> we know who will be hurt. Um, the city of New York will be hurt. The state of New York will be hurt. Um, so it's it's partly a matter of making the the bandwidth for people to get in there and get their voices heard in the the congressional. I. Of all the things I've learned tonight, um, the comment that we have 200 members of Congress who've never been through a farm bill reauthorization, that's that's scary <laughs> because a lot of trading goes on in the farm bill process that um, takes people have to get used to the idea. They have to hold their noses and, and uh, support some things they don't love in order to get what, what we need. Uh, I want the four of you to ask the last word, but I've had the experience of um, newly elected legislators in New York State, who are often from urban areas, New York City and elsewhere, who get assigned the Ag Committee because they're new. And I always say, that's great. This is a chance to put the two together. Even if you're from like, you know, the asphalt jungle where I live in Manhattan, where, you know, there are not a lot of, there's not a lot of uh, farming going on. Um, I have a question, I think, for Myron, and it's prompted by David. He's talking about moving away from chemical fertilizers and pestis, toxic pesticides. And I suspect that's something you get uh, questioned about a lot from the farming community and consumers 
at the Cornell uh, Cooperative Extension, how are the producers in other parts of the state um, shifting their methods and, and are you uh, providing a lot of consulting time to them? So, so sure. So, you know, it's interesting that the organic food movement across the United States and specifically in New York City has continued to grow. And when we look at organic, there's very specific requirements, but also any, say, produce farmer um, needs to follow all federal and state rules regarding fertilizers and that kind of stuff. Um, but I love that we have a Geneva research station out in Western New York with Cornell, where we are doing all sorts of research on how to answer that exact question. How can we grow better plants that, that grow larger fruit and vegetables that are hardier, that have longer growing seasons? And there are some amazingly smart people um, who are in labs every day in Geneva trying to answer that question. But at the federal level in the Farm Bill, we need to have the equivalent of good food purchasing for food subsidy. We need to have good food subsidizing so that the values of protecting the worker, of protecting the health of, of consumers and of communities can be reflected in our, in our crop insurance and commodity subsidy. Um, so as I said, move it more toward my plate so, so, so that we're subsidizing the foods we want people to eat more of and not the foods that end up as junk. Deborah Gardner asks about um, whether the food distribution by food pantries is sustainable on the current scale. I know, Janet, you've written a lot about food pantries and all of you have dealt with the subject. Is what they're doing now sustainable over the, I guess, the short and medium term? You know, for me, I there's not a yes or no answer to that, but frankly, the the COVID experience has been a bonanza for the food charity um, establishment. Enormous philanthropic grants to food banks and huge increases in their, in their revenues and great work that they did keeping people going. I think we need to be asking the question of do we want to expand food charity? Or do we want to create the kinds of fundamental income access, jobs, and income uh, support programs that enable people to participate in um, a, a revitalized and um, reinfrastructured uh, commercial food system? I would rather buy my food at the grocery store than have to pick it up at a food pantry. And so, is it sustainable? Is a good question, but I think. It, we need to go deeper to the question, is this really our vision for the future? Is bigger, better food pantries? Right, I mean, I, I agree with you, Janet, and I think you know the whole poverty issue is, is underlying all of this, right? So, I mean, we, we don't have another two hours, three hours, five hours to discuss right. that, but I think you know that's gotta be addressed. Yeah. It's the growing well, I, quality. I have to thank all of you. It's been wonderful. I've learned a lot. And uh, this is a subject we'll obviously continue at Roosevelt House and Living New Deal. I want to thank Janet, Annette, Kate, and Myron, and of course, uh, Lou Venich of Living New Deal New York and our working group, who is the producer of this event, the estimable historian and curator, Deborah Gardner of Roosevelt House, the staff of Roosevelt House, Mac Barrett, Daniel Culkin, uh, Arlene Geiger of Living New Deal New York, and all of you, and uh, we all got to eat. So uh, we'll continue this discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, this was recorded. So all you have to do is go to the Living New Deal or Roosevelt House sites, livingnewdeal.org or roosevelthouse.hunter.cuny.edu. And if you have any questions that you didn't get answered, I'm happy to pass them on to the panelists directly through our websites. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a Thanks, good night, Jeff. everyone. Good night.